Adventure of the Missing Brother Mr. Charles Phillips was, as has been hinted, a gentleman of pronounced scientific tastes. In his early days, he had devoted himself with fond enthusiasm to the agreeable study of biology, and a brief monograph on the embryology of the microscopic holothuria had formed his first contribution to the Belle Lettre. Later, he had somewhat relaxed the severity of his pursuits, and had dabbled in the more frivolous subjects of paleontology and ethnology. He had a cabinet in his sitting room whose drawers were stuffed with rude flint implements, and a charming fetish from the South Seas was the dominant note in the decorative scheme of the apartment. Flattering himself with the title of materialist, he was, in truth, one of the most credulous of men, but he required a marvel to be neatly draped in the robes of science before he would give it any credit, and the wildest dreams took solid shape to him if only the nomenclature were severe and irreproachable. He laughed at the witch, but quailed before the powers of the hypnotist, lifting his eyebrows when Christianity was mentioned, but adoring protile and the ether. For the rest, he prided himself on a boundless skepticism, the average tale of wonder he heard with nothing but contempt, and he would certainly not have credited a word or syllable of Dyson's story of the pursuer and the pursued unless the gold coin had been produced as visible and tangible evidence. As it was, he half suspected that Dyson had imposed on him. He knew his friend's disordered fancies and his habit of conjuring up the marvelous to account for the entirely commonplace. And, on the whole, he was inclined to think that the so-called facts of the odd adventure had been gravely distorted in the telling. Since the evening on which he had listened to the tale, he had paid Dyson a visit, and had delivered himself of some serious talk on the necessity of accurate observation, and the folly, as he put it, of using a kaleidoscope instead of a telescope in the view of things, to which remarks his friend had listened with a smile that was extremely sardonic. My dear fellow, Dyson had remarked at last, you will allow me to tell you that I see your drift perfectly. However, you will be astonished to hear that I consider you to be the visionary, while I am a sober and serious spectator of human life. You have gone round the circle, and while you fancy yourself far in the golden land of new philosophies, you are in reality a dweller in a metaphorical clapham. Your skepticism has defeated itself and become a monstrous credulity. You are, in fact, in a position of the bat or owl, I forget which it is, who denied the existence of the sun at noonday. And I shall be astonished if you do not one day come to me full of contrition for your manifold intellectual errors, with a humble resolution to see things in their true light for the future. This tirade had left Mr. Phillips unimpressed. He considered Dyson as hopeless, and he went home to gloat over some primitive stone implements that a friend had sent him from India. He found that his landlady, seeing them displayed in all their rude formlessness upon the table, had removed the collection to the dustbin, and had replaced it by lunch, and the afternoon was spent in malodorous research. Mrs. Brown, hearing these stones spoken of as very valuable knives, had called him, in his hearing, poor Mr. Phillips, and between rage and evil odors he spent a sorry afternoon. It was four o'clock before he had completed his work of rescue, and overpowered with the flavors of decaying cabbage leaves, Phillips felt that he must have a walk to gain an appetite for the evening meal. Unlike Dyson, he walked fast, with his eyes on the pavement, absorbed in his thoughts, and oblivious of the life around him. He could not have told by what streets he had passed, when he suddenly lifted up his eyes and found himself in Leicester Square. The grass and flowers pleased him, and he welcomed the opportunity of resting for a few minutes, and glancing round, he saw a bench which had only one occupant, a lady, and as she was seated at one end, Phillips took up a position at the other extremity, and began to pass in angry review the events of the afternoon. He had noticed, as he came up to the bench, that the person already there was neatly dressed, and to all appearance, young. Her face he could not see, as it was turned away in apparent contemplation of the shrubs, 
and moreover shielded with her hand. But it would be doing wrong to Mr. Phillips to imagine that his choice of a seat was dictated by any hopes of an affair of the heart. He had simply preferred the company of one lady to that of five dirty children, and having seated himself, was immersed directly in thoughts of his misfortunes. He had meditated changing his lodgings, but now, on a judicial review of the case in all its bearings, his calmer judgment told him that the race of landladies is like to the race of the leaves, and that there was but little to choose between them. He resolved, however, to talk to Mrs. Brown, the offender, very coolly and yet severely, to point out the extreme indiscretion of her conduct, and to express a hope for better things in the future. With this decision registered in his mind, Phillips was about to get up from the seat and move off, when he was intensely annoyed to hear a stifled sob, evidently from the lady who still continued her contemplation of the shrubs and flower beds. He clutched his stick desperately, and in a moment would have been in full retreat when the lady turned her face towards him, and with a mute entreaty bespoke his attention. She was a young girl with a quaint and piquant rather than a beautiful face and she was evidently in the bitterest distress. Mr. Phillips sat down again and cursed his chances heartily. The young lady looked at him with a pair of charming eyes of a shining hazel, which showed no trace of tears, though a handkerchief was in her hand. She bit her lip and seemed to struggle with some overpowering grief, and her whole attitude was all beseeching and imploring. Phillips sat on the edge of the bench gazing awkwardly at her, and wondering what was to come next, and she looked at him still, without speaking. "'Well, madame,' he said at last, "'I understood from your gesture that he wished to speak to me. Is there anything I can do for you? Though if you will pardon me, I cannot help saying that that seems highly improbable.' "'Ah, sir,' she said in a low murmuring voice, "'do not speak harshly to me. I am in sore straits, and I thought from your face that I could safely ask your sympathy, if not your help. Would you kindly tell me what is the matter, said Phillips? Perhaps you would like some tea. I knew I could not be mistaken, the lady replied. That offer of refreshment bespeaks a generous mind. But tea, alas, is powerless to console me. If you will let me, I shall endeavor to explain my trouble. I should be glad if you would. I shall do so, and I shall try and be brief in spite of the numerous complications which have made me, young as I am, tremble before what seems the profound and terrible mysteries of existence. Yet the grief which now racks my very soul is but too simple. I have lost my brother. Lost your brother? How on earth can that be? I see I must trouble you with a few particulars. My brother, then, who is by some years my elder, is a tutor in a private school in the extreme north of London. The want of means deprived him of the advantages of a university education, and lacking the stamp of a degree, he could not hope for that position which his scholarship and his talents entitled him to claim. He was thus forced to accept the post of classical master at Dr. Saunderson's Highgate Academy for the sons of gentlemen and he has performed his duties with perfect satisfaction to his principal for some years. My personal history need not trouble you. It will be enough if I tell you that for the last month I have been a governess in a family residing at Tooting. My brother and I have always cherished the warmest mutual affection, and though circumstances into which I need not enter have kept us apart for some time, yet we have never lost sight of one another. We made up our minds that unless one of us was absolutely unable to rise from a bed of sickness, we should never let a week pass without meeting, and some time ago we chose this square as our rendezvous on account of its central position and its convenience of access. And indeed, after a week of distasteful toil, my brother felt little inclination for much walking, and we have often spent two or three hours on this bench, speaking of our prospects of happier days when we were children. In the early spring it was cold and chilly, still we enjoyed the short respite, and I think that we were often taken for a pair of lovers, as we sat close together, eagerly talking. Saturday after Saturday we have met each other here, and though the doctor told him it was madness, my brother would not allow the influenza to break the appointment, 
That was some time ago. Last Saturday, we had a long and happy afternoon, and separated more cheerfully than usual, feeling that the coming week would be bearable, and resolving that our next meeting should be, if possible, still more pleasant. I arrived here at the time agreed upon, four o'clock, and sat down and watched for my brother, expecting every moment to see him advancing towards me from the gate at the north side of the square. Five minutes passed by, and he had not arrived. I thought he must have missed his train, and the idea that our interview would be cut short by twenty minutes, or perhaps half an hour, saddened me. I had hoped we should be so happy together today. Suddenly, moved by I know not what impulse, I turned abruptly around, and how can I describe to you my astonishment when I saw my brother advancing slowly towards me from the southern side of the square, accompanied by another person? My first thought, I remember, had in it something of resentment that this man, whoever he was, should intrude himself into our meeting. I wondered who it could possibly be, for my brother had, I may say, no intimate friends. Then as I looked still at the advancing figures, another feeling took possession of me. It was a sensation of bristling fear, the fear of the child in the dark, unreasonable and unreasoning, but terrible, clutching at my heart as with the cold grip of a dead man's hands. Yet I overcame the feeling and looked steadily at my brother, waiting for him to speak, and more closely at his companion. Then I noticed that this man was leading my brother rather than walking arm in arm with him. He was a tall man, dressed in quite ordinary fashion. He wore a high bowler hat, and in spite of the warmth of the day, a plain black overcoat, tightly buttoned, and I noticed his trousers of a quiet black and grey stripe. The face was commonplace too, and indeed I cannot recall any special features or any trick of expression, for though I looked at him as he came near, Curiously enough, his face made no impression on me. It was as though I had seen a well-made mask. They passed in front of me, and to my unutterable astonishment, I heard my brother's voice speaking to me, though his lips did not move, nor his eyes look into mine. It was a voice I cannot describe, though I knew it, but the words came to my ears, as if mingled with plashing water, and the sound of a shallow brook flowing amidst stones. I heard then the words, I cannot stay, and for a moment the heavens and the earth seemed to rush together with the sound of thunder, and I was thrust forth from the world into a black void without beginning and without end. For, as my brother passed me, I saw the hand that held him by the arm and seemed to guide him, and in one moment of horror I realized that it was a formless thing that had moldered for many years in the grave. The flesh was peeled in strips from the bones, and hung apart dry and granulated, and the fingers that encircled my brother's arms were all unshapen claw-like things, and one was but a stump from which the end had rotted off. When I recovered my senses, I saw the two passing out by that gate. I paused for a moment, and then with a rush as a fire to my heart, I knew that no horror could stay me, but that I must follow my brother and save him, even though all hell rose up against me. I ran out and looked up the pavement, and saw the two figures walking amidst the crowd. I ran across the road, and saw them turn up that side street, and I reached the corner a moment later. In vain I looked to right and left, for neither my brother nor his strange guardian was in sight. Two elderly men were coming down arm in arm, and a telegraph boy was walking lustily along, whistling. I remained there a moment, horror-struck, and then I bowed my head and returned to this seat where you found me. Now, sir, do you wonder at my grief? Oh, tell me, what has happened to my brother, or I feel I shall go mad? Mr. Phillips, who had listened with exemplary patience to this tale, hesitated a moment before he spoke. My dear madame, he said at length, you have known how to engage me in your service, not only as a man, but as a student of science. As a fellow creature, I pity you most profoundly. You must have suffered extremely from what you saw, or rather, from what you fancied you saw. For, as a scientific observer, it is my duty to tell you the plain truth, which, indeed, besides being true, must also console you. 
Allow me to ask you, then, to describe your brother. Certainly, said the lady eagerly. I can describe him accurately. My brother is a somewhat young-looking man. He is pale, has small black whiskers, and wears spectacles. He has rather a timid, almost a frightened expression, and looks about him nervously from side to side. Think, think. Surely you must have seen him. Perhaps you are a habitué of this engaging quarter. You may have met him on some previous Saturday. I may have been mistaken in supposing that he turned up that side street. He may have gone on, and you may have passed each other. Oh, tell me, sir, whether you have not seen him. I am afraid I do not keep a very sharp lookout when I am walking, said Phillips, who would have passed his mother unnoticed. But I am sure your description is admirable. And now will you describe the person who, you say, held your brother by the arm? I cannot do so. I told you his face seemed devoid of expression or salient feature. It was like a mask. Exactly. You cannot describe what you have never seen. I need hardly point out to you the conclusion to be drawn. You have been the victim of a hallucination. You expected to see your brother. You were alarmed because you did not see him. And unconsciously, no doubt, your brain went to work, and finally you saw a mere projection of your own morbid thoughts, a vision of your absent brother, and a mere confusion of terrors incorporated in a figure which you can't describe. Of course your brother has been, in some way, prevented from coming to meet you as usual. I expect you will hear from him in a day or two. The lady looked seriously at Mr. Phillips, and then for a second there seemed almost a twinkling as of mirth about her eyes, but her face clouded sadly at the dogmatic conclusions to which the scientist was led so irresistibly. Ah, she said, you do not know. I cannot doubt the evidence of my waking senses. Besides, perhaps I have had experiences even more terrible. I acknowledge the force of your arguments, but a woman has intuitions which never deceive her. Believe me, I am not hysterical. Feel my pulse. It is quite regular. She stretched out her hand with a dainty gesture and a glance that enraptured Phillips in spite of himself. The hand held out to him was soft and white and warm, and as, in some confusion, he placed his fingers on the purple vein, he felt profoundly touched by the spectacle of love and grief before him. No, he said as he released her wrist, as you say, you are evidently quite yourself. Still, you must be aware that living men do not possess dead hands. That sort of thing doesn't happen. It is, of course, barely possible that you did see your brother with another gentleman, and that important business prevented him from stopping. As for the wonderful hand, there may have been some deformity, a finger shot off by accident, or something of that sort. The lady shook her head mournfully. I see you are a determined rationalist, she said. Did you not hear me say that I have had experiences even more terrible? I, too, was once a skeptic, but after what I have known, I can no longer affect to doubt. Madame, replied Mr. Phillips, no one shall make me deny my faith. I will never believe, nor will I pretend to believe, that two and two make five, nor will I, on any pretenses, admit the existence of two-sided triangles. You are a little hasty rejoined the lady. But may I ask you if you have ever heard the name of Professor Gregg, the authority on ethnology and kindred subjects? I have done much more than merely hear of Professor Gregg, said Phillips. I always regarded him as one of our most acute and clear-headed observers, and his last publication, The Textbook of Ethnology, struck me as being quite admirable in its kind. Indeed, the book had but come into my hands when I heard of the terrible accident which cut short Gregg's career. He had, I think, taken a country house in the west of England for the summer, and is supposed to have fallen into a river. So far as I remember, his body was never recovered. Sir, I am sure that you are discreet. Your conversation seems to declare as much, and the very title of that work of yours, which you mentioned, assures me that you are no empty trifler. In a word, I feel that I may depend on you. You appear to be under the impression that Professor Gregg is dead. I have no reason to believe that that is the case. What? cried Phillips, astonished and perturbed. 
You do not hint that there was anything disgraceful. I cannot believe it. Greg was a man of clearest character. His private life was one of great benevolence. And though I myself am free from delusions, I believe him to have been a sincere and devout Christian. Surely you cannot mean to insinuate that some disreputable history forced him to flee the country. Again you are in a hurry, replied the lady. I said nothing of all this. Briefly, then, I must tell you that Professor Gregg left his house one morning in full health, both of mind and body. He never returned, but his watch and chain, and purse containing three sovereigns in gold, and some loose silver, with a ring that he wore habitually, were found three days later on a wild and savage hillside, many miles from the river. These articles were placed beside a limestone rock of fantastic form. They had been wrapped into a parcel with a kind of rough parchment, which was secured with gut. The parcel was opened, and the inner side of the parchment bore an inscription done with some red substance. The characters were undecipherable, but seemed to be a corrupt cuneiform. "'You interest me intensely,' said Phillips. "'Would you mind continuing your story? "'The circumstance you have mentioned "'seems to me of the most inexplicable character, "'and I thirst for an elucidation.' "'The young lady seemed to meditate for a moment, "'and she then proceeded to relate "'the novel of the Black Seal.'